Can you believe it that we have finally reached 1 million subscribers? I'd like to say thank you so much for all of your support and I am looking forward to seeing what the future brings to the channel. Right, without any further ado, let's get on to this week's video. It is the 30th of July 1984 and emergency workers are pouring over the wreckage of an express train. It had derailed at a speed of 85 miles an hour. The disaster would highlight the risks of a recent at the time addition to the railway, that is of the driving brake standard open carriage, which allows for faster turnaround times. Don't worry, we will go into this fact a little bit more detail later on in the video. The culprit of the crash is a stray cow. Welcome to Plain Difficult and my name is John. forward. Cows are bastards. Not only do they contribute methane to the atmosphere and have horrendously long tongues, but they, as I recently found out, once caused a train crash in the UK. Just one stray cow would be responsible for the loss of 13 lives. To put that into context, it's more than the Hatfield and Potter's Bar rail crashes combined. Now this disaster was somewhat not on my radar until it was suggested to me by some of you on here. Suggestions really do help me out so please keep them coming. Right, let's get into the video proper. Background. I feel like a good place to start is not the location but straight to the geeky stuff, i.e. the train in our disaster. You see train services that use locomotives have always had an issue. This is at the end of the line. Imagine a locomotive hauled train. Normally, when you think of one, you think of one locomotive only on one end, and that's how they have been traditionally arranged. Because, well, the driver needs to see, and you usually control the locomotive from, well, the locomotive. But this creates an issue. When a train gets to the end of the line, the locomotive needs to get back to the other end of the train for its return journey. This requires a section of track beyond where the train stops for the locomotive to go onto and then run around the formation. But how do you avoid this? One method is to have a locomotive at each end. Great, but inefficient, as you have two expensive assets tied up in one train. You can also have another locomotive come along at the end of the line to then couple up to return it to the other direction. Again, this does also tie up two locomotives, at least for a short period of time. Another method is to build a multiple unit style train, where propulsion and carriages are all combined into a single unit. This is extra great, and it is the way mainline trains are mainly built nowadays, at least in the UK. But again, this takes time and is expensive, especially when you already have locomotives and coaching stock. So what do you do if you have locomotives and passenger carriages already in your fleet? and you want to reduce the turnaround times and eliminate the need to run a locomotive round a train. What if you keep the locomotive at one end and have the driver in the other when needed? This is where remote control of the locomotive comes into the mix. Many solutions over the years have come and gone, including putting the locomotive in the middle. But for today, we're going to really only focus on British Rail solution that came about in the 1970s. This was the driving brake open standard carriage. This was a Mark II coaching stock carriage modified by creating a cab with driving controls at one end. 14 were built in 1979 for use with the Mark III passenger carriages and a diesel Class 47 locomotive for the Glasgow to Edinburgh express train route. They began to work the route in 1980. Edinburgh to Glasgow via the Falkirk line is the main route between Scotland's two biggest cities. It is a vital link, running through nine stations over a distance of just under 50 miles. The line, at least in the 1970s and 1980s, is unelectrified, thus diesel trains ply the route. For the most part, there are two tracks, one in each direction. As I mentioned earlier, there are nine stations, and one station on the line is Polmont. The line around the area has a maximum speed of 100 miles an hour, and runs through a cutting with a canal on the southern side. During the early 1980s, a number of crossings were fenced off from the line and a greater separation of the line was sought. At mile point, 23 and a quarter, 
there was a crossing known as the West Quarter Level Crossing. It had been fenced off and taken out of use in 1981. However, after closing off, multiple occurrences of people trespassing were found in the area. You see, there was a housing estate to the north of the line and woods to the south, and people enjoyed going to the woods. As such, the fencing was often found broken down. British Rail had repaired the fencing loads of times since its install, leading to a large risk of not just humans wandering onto the line, which is exactly what would happen on the 30th of July 1984. This week there is no sponsorship, so instead I thought I'd fill out the usual sponsorship space with a little bit of a plug for my own bits and pieces. So here goes it, this is my second YouTube channel, which is at www.youtube.com slash at madebyjohnmusic. And also my Instagram, which is at www.instagram.com slash plainly.john. Right, let's get on to the next part of the video. The disaster. It is the 30th of July 1984, and the 1730 Edinburgh to Glasgow is departing Linlithgow Station. It is roughly 20 minutes after the start of its journey from Edinburgh, and so far has seemed pretty normal. The train consisted of a Class 47 locomotive at the Edinburgh end and five Mark III carriages with the driving brake open standard at the Glasgow end. The train's length was 155 metres and in total weighed 315.5 tonnes. Interestingly, a third of the total weight was at the rear in the locomotive. In the opposite direction, an Edinburgh-bound train left Falkirk. As it rolled along the line, the driver saw a single cow on the embankment. His next stop was Palmont. Upon reaching, he reported the cow to station staff. Around the same time, the 17 Firth T service to Glasgow passed through non stop at roughly 85 miles an hour. There is a slight right hand curve, and as the train navigates this, the driver sees the cow on the line around 450 metres away. At the speed the train is travelling, the driver has only a maximum of 12 seconds to react although it won't save a crash. He applies emergency brakes, but impact with the animal is unavoidable. The leading carriage struck the cow, the majority of which exploded. However, the less fleshy parts of the animal were dragged down in front of the left-hand side of the leading bogey. The carcass was dragged around 5.5 metres until one of the animal's legs became caught between the wheel and the rail. This was enough to cause the left hand front wheel to ride up off the rail. The right hand wheel then also left the track. The train ran for approximately 98 metres with the front bogey derailed. The front carriage veered off to the left running up the embankment, crashing through a stone wall and dragging along the ridge line, eventually striking a tree and turned detaching its bogies in the process. The leading carriage ended up on its side with the driving cab facing the opposite direction. The second carriage pushed towards the right, being forced along by the weight of the train behind it. It broke its coupling and went up the right-hand embankment. The remaining part of the train continued onwards, with the third carriage moving off to the left. In all, the complete disaster had happened in just a matter of moments. A train approaching in the opposite direction, which was the 1730 Glasgow to Edinburgh, was travelling at roughly 65 miles an hour. The driver saw what he thought was a railway carriage doing a somersault off in the distance and he slammed on his brakes. After coming to a stop, he made his way to a signal post telephone, but the line was dead. He told the train's guard to go and get emergency protection set up and asked the passenger to go to the nearby houses to call the emergency services. The driver and some railway workers who were travelling on his train made their way towards the crash site. They assisted where they could. Roughly 12 minutes after the crash, emergency workers started arriving on scene. This was around 10 minutes past 7 in the evening. Soon after it became apparent that a crash had resulted in casualties, multiple passengers had been flung out of the windows of the leading two carriages. And sadly, this is where the majority of the victims were situated. In total, 13 were passed away in the collision, with nearly 50 being injured, varying from life-changing to minor. The crash had blocked both roads, and after extensive rail repairs, re-railing of carriages and craning out of the wreckages, the line was reopened on the 1st of August. Needless to say, a crash resulting in multiple deaths would pique the interest of the public, and the government alike. 
As such, an investigation into the cause of the crash would follow. The investigation. An inquiry was set up to look into the cause and make, if any, recommendations. It would involve looking at the crash site, interviewing survivors, and looking into historical incidents in the area. It was discovered that cattle on the line resulting in an impact was not unheard of. Over the previous five years, there had been seven such occasions, of which two were near Palmont. None had resulted in a derailment. The cow in question, which was hit on that fateful evening, was 450 kilograms, with a height of 1.2 meters from the ground, which was a fairly average size. So how did it cause the derailment? Well, the senior lecturer in the Department of Veterinarian Pathology at the University of Glasgow was interviewed for the investigation. He posited that one of the animal's thicker bones had a potential to withstand a wheel load of 4.5 tons, enough to raise the wheel's flange above the track. This was backed up by a large amount of animal remains along the left-hand side of the running line, hinting that the cow had been dragged along by the leading bogey. Once the wheel was lifted and derailed, a disaster of some type was inevitable and with the nature of the train having most of its weight at the rear, the leading carriage had enough force to push it off the line in the violent manner that we saw in the disaster. So how did the cow get on the line? Well, the inquiry had their work cut out for them a little bit here, as quite a large part of the boundary walling and fencing had been destroyed in the crash, so it was hard to pinpoint exactly where the cow had got onto the line, but it was likely that a gap in the fence was created by trespassers. But how did a gap not get noticed during track inspections? Well, you see track workers, when they walk the line inspecting, they are meant to report any fence gaps. However, this is only a secondary task being prioritised below track inspection. This meant that a gap could be missed. The report into the crash was published in 1985, summarising the cause of the disaster. The derailment was caused when, after a collision with a cow, some part of the animal passed beneath the leading wheels of the train, causing them to leave the rails. The outcome then was a matter of chance, coupled with the local topography and speed of the train. Because of the history of damage caused by vandals to fencing at the closed west quarter level crossing, I believe the animal probably gained access to the line at this point through fencing damage by trespassers. The report recommended cab radios, which could have sped up the reporting of the cow and of the crash. It also recommended better fencing and wheel guards, which are these things. A reworking of the rulebook to report any large animals within the railway boundary was enacted, which is definitely a good thing. The leading carriage was written off in the crash, but the driving brake standard open would continue to see use, eventually being transferred to the Great Eastern Main Line and eventually off to use at Network Rail's track monitoring trains. So it's going to be scale time. It's going to be a four for this one and here is what I have for the bingo card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Plenty Foot production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Like Licensed. Plenty Foot videos are produced by me, John, in a very warm and sweaty corner of Southern London, UK. I have Instagram and a second YouTube channel as well as Twitter so check all those bits out for your random bits and pieces of other bits and stuff I get up to and I'd like to say a very warm especially today warm thank you to my Patreon and YouTube members for your financial support as well as the rest of you for tuning in every week to see my crappy cartoons and listen to my dodgy voice and all I have to say is thank you for watching and Mr Music play us out please <laughs>